Three years later, they fired their Super Bowl winning head coach. They traded the highest paid QB in franchise history. And they traded down in the 2021 NFL Draft. What does it all mean now? Find out during the draft from the premier Philadelphia Eagles reporter, Derek Gunn. Watch, listen to Draft Takes with Derek Gunn across the Jacob Media Network, YouTube, Apple, and Spotify. Thanks for tuning in to Birds 365 with the Mac and Mac guys, John McMullen, Jody McDonald. We're down to just 59 and a half hours until the NFL draft uh, with the Jacksonville Jags hopping on the clock. That we don't really need much help with. We're 99.9% sure it's going to be Trevor Lawrence. All the other picks, we need help. And for that, we bring in from the NFLDraftBible.com, our buddy Rick Saratella, how are you this morning, Rick? Good morning, gentlemen. 59 hours and a half. Glad somebody's keeping track. <laughs> Matt, 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 not my very strongest suit, but this much I could do. All right. Uh, you probably got on hold early enough to hear uh, myself and Jay Mack going back and forth screaming about Devonta Smith. You know how much I love the kid. And you can attest to this. Before John McMullen and I were working together, you and I have been doing draft spots. I told you last year he was the most talented wide receiver on the Alabama roster, which included Jalen Waddle, who some people have going ahead of him this year. Ridiculous. And or the two that came off the board in the top 15 picks last year. So you know that I've loved this kid before he ever went out and won a Heisman Trophy. Uh, where should he be ranked? Where is he going to come off the board? How big a problem is his size in the National Football League, if any? Yeah, I remember having those conversations because Henry Ruggs and, and uh, Jerry Judy were two first round picks a year ago coming out of Alabama. And we said, wow, Mac Jones, what a supporting cast he had. Uh, but, you know, it, it's it's still an issue because, well, let, let's take Henry Ruggs, for example. He's kind of a smaller ish type of receiver in the John Ross kind of mold that. You know, I, I tried to go find some receivers hanging out in the NFL under 180 pounds. Aside from Deshaun Jackson, it's hard to find one. And I also checked Deshaun Jackson played, you know, started all 16 games once in his entire career. So, you know, can he perform at a high level? Absolutely. Can he play 17 plus 20 games at the NFL level? I think it, I think it's always got to be in the back of your mind, the long-term durability and, if you're saying, hey, I'm happy with one contract, sure, let's get through it. But in terms of long-term durability, isn't it interesting that the Dolphins at six are going to opt for, it sounds like, Jalen Waddell over Devontae Smith, who you know, is three inches shorter but about 10, 15 pounds heavier? Yeah, and I, I do think, Rick, it's interesting when, for instance, I had Devontae rated 13th, that that's some kind of insult. That means you're a really good football player um, in the NFL draft. Anybody's in the top 15. But I do think you have to be cognizant of the fact that just what you said. I mean, Deshaun Jackson, to me, is the ceiling. And by the way, that's a heck of a ceiling. That's one of the arguably the greatest deep threat right there with Randy Moss in the history of this game. I'd take that. I'd sign that up for today. He's a great route runner, Deshaun. I think people have been sort of a little bit negative because of the final years of his career, but it was really, really successful. I just don't think I have that Calvin Johnson upside to talk about that kid top five that in that type situation. Yeah, and remember Deshaun Jackson, a, a buck sixty nine coming out of Cal, he slid to the second round. There was no yeah. wide receiver taken in the first round that year. And if I remember correctly, Tavon Austin may yeah. have also been in that draft, a dynamic college player, but again, just kind of too small to to survive long term over the long haul. All right. Um since we went there comparing uh, Deshaun Jackson with Devonta Smith, uh, you call it uh, Johnny Mac is uh, ceiling. What's Jalen Waddle's ceiling? Who, who are we going to comp him to? Uh, which, by the way, I think 
uh, Adam uh, Smith will be better than uh, Deshaun Jackson. So I don't think it's his ceiling. I don't think it's his floor, but I, I think he can go above and beyond that. Where's Jalen Waddle sit? And on a comp, what's his ceiling? I, I kind of view him as like a DJ Moore kind of player uh, with the Carolina Panthers, similar type with a higher ceiling, a higher upside. I think the uh, plus side with Jalen Waddle is he also returns kicks and punts punt returns becoming more valuable uh, with the new kickoff rules. So the fact that he can do that, I think, you know, really appeals to NFL teams as well. Um, but more, I think more from Carolina is, is a comparable player off the top of my head. Well, that not that's not what people are going to want to hear. But I do think, Rick, you have to explain the comp situation. You're, you're comparing traits. You're comparing the type of player sure. as opposed to any time – we talk about the NFL draft. I mean, it's tough to project anybody. Trevor Lawrence, who is about as clean as prospect you're going to get about a quarterback, it's tough to project him going into Canton. I mean, it's just rare, and there's, yeah. it's rare for a reason. Yeah, you, you hate to put a yellow jacket label on a guy, yeah. but there's another Carolina Panthers receiver. If I said, hey, Jalen, Jalen Waddle's ceiling would be a Steve Smith Jr., hey, anybody will sign yeah. up for that, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that could be – you know, maybe the ceiling. And so, you know, I, I like Jalen Waddle, but again, like here's a guy that had durability issues this past season and teams are still value, value, value him over a Devonta Smith. So it, it's into uh, Devonta Rice, I should say. Right. Right. There. <laughs> um, beware, when a kid just keeps rattling off all pro uh, seasons, you guys will remember talking to me ahead of time. Um, you and I talked so much during the last couple of years, Ricky, at the beginning of this year, we talked about the players way to evaluation and what kind of ranking you would have them in. Uh, you had Panay Sewell as a top three talent in the upcoming draft, even though he was sitting out the year opting out in Oregon. Uh, you uh, said, Jody, check the videotape on this kid. He dominated an entire season. Uh, he's going to be highly drafted. Yet over the last couple of days, there have been some rumblings that maybe the Bengals are going another direction at five. Most people say, well, the only reason we got down to five because because quarterbacks are going to be taken in front of them. Well, if the Bengals don't take them, and then the Dolphins <laughs> don't take them, all of a sudden, Panay Sewell's down in that seven, eight range. Am I speaking out my ear hole, or uh, is this something that actually could happen? Yeah, well, all these quarterbacks are moving up the board, right? So somebody has to slide. And you know, 10, 15 years ago, I think teams were still building from the inside out. And a guy like Penny Sewell and Rashawn Slater, these would be highly valuable commodities. Now it's, hey, it's a high scoring league, wing it and fling it. You need weapons. It's basically a shootout every Sunday. And if you can't put points on the board, well, then you're not going to be able to compete. And so you see now Atlanta could take Kyle Pitts. Cincinnati could take a Jamar Chase. Miami could take a Jalen Waddle, and now suddenly, you know, a Penny Sewell could fall in the laps of a Detroit, or that could be where a team like the Chargers at 13 or the Vikings at 14, both looking for offensive linemen. I'm sure they would love to get their hands on a Penny Sewell or Rashawn Slater. Even if the Dolphins go offensive tackle at six, you still have to have the conversation. Do we take the right tackle in Slater or the left tackle in Sewell? Because two is the lefty thrower. Do you want to build a team and construct your roster against with a, a quarterback that's not durable? Or do you take the best available talent? There's going to be a lot of uh, heated war room debates because to me, Sewell is the third best player. But then you look at that LSU offense. It was so prolific two years ago. Chase, Burrow, 15 touchdowns of 40 plus yards or more. It's hard to pass that up. All right, Rick, I'm going to get this question and then fix my light situation. But um, uh, I, I do want to ask you about the veteran quarterbacks in this draft because Kyle Shanahan spoke yesterday in his pre-draft ability. How might this affect? If you think about the Patriots in their history with Jimmy Garoppolo, and, you know, they had hoped at one point, let's be honest, that the timing would work out so they could go directly from Tom Brady to Jimmy Garoppolo. He's probably available. And the Patriots might want a quarterback, might want to go up to get a quarterback. You think about Denver, George Payton, first-time general manager out there, has a history of Minnesota. He drafted Teddy Bridgewater. He likes him. There's a potential that, that they could go after Teddy Bridgewater. 
How would that affect, or will it affect in your mind, that that status of the Trey Lances of the world, or assuming Atlanta is not going to go quarterback at this point, Justin Fields, could they start to slip a little bit? I think if they start to slip, that's where you can, again, start to see some trades. And once you start getting into that area, of, I think seven really is where the Patriots could realistically start to think about moving up from 15 because you saw the ransom that the 49ers had to give up from 12 yeah. to three. They had to give up two additional first round picks. So for to get from 15, you know, anything up closer than seven, I think once Justin Fields, who the, the Patriots have been linked to, if Fields is on the board at seven, those conversations start to happen. I think Detroit would be more than happy to trade back. Carolina could be willing to trade back. Uh, Denver, to your point, if, if they're willing to trade back, that's where you could see a trade up for a quarterback. And Jimmy Garoppolo, I, I think the 49ers would be happy to get a second round pick at this point. But I think the issue has always been durability. He was always dinged up in New England, even when he wasn't the starter. And he's always been dinged up in San Francisco. You know, it, it's really going to say, hey, what's the cost on a Jimmy Garoppolo? A second? Okay, what's the cost to trade up? and get a Justin Fields, who do I like better? We'll find out in 59 and a half hours. Rick, when I talked to you last night, you kind of surprised me, saying that uh, there's the possibility that a second tight end after Kyle Pitts could go in the bottom half of the first round. Um, my evaluations are not even close, that there is as big a chasm as you can think of between the first tight end and the second tight end in this draft. Uh, give me a reason why it's not as big as I think uh, and tell me that there are tight ends here to be had if you don't get Kyle Pitts. I don't think so. I think there's a good chance that the next tight end isn't going to be drafted till the third round, let alone the end of the first. There might not be a tight end taken in the second round that after Pitts, there's this uh, momentous uh, drop off. Who are the guys who will be next up on the uh, tight end list? And how far do you think they'll you have to wait before you hear their name come off the board? I, I think a, a common phrase you're going to hear, especially in the first round, is I didn't see that coming. Oh, man, what a surprise. Because it is it is a rather thin, in terms of depth, draft class. And typically I have 14 to 18 first round grades, players that you say, hey, any given year, these are first round guys. Uh, this year... I feel comfortable with like 10, maybe 12 guys. And so I would imagine that's very similar uh, thinking around the league is, you know, after your first dozen rated prospects, these teams boards are much different than what the media has. And it's all about need. It's all about fit. It's all about scheme. And so there there's, there's scouts out there with a first round grade on Hunter long out of Boston college. Who's very long, by the way, one of the longest wingspans of any tight end I've ever seen. And so this is a guy that can be a pass weapon. Uh, he can, you know, do some inline blocking there at Boston college. And so he's a dark horse candidate, Tommy tremble from Notre Dame. If you want an old school throwback, you know, uh, hard nosed blocking tight end who won't hurt you in the passing game, by the way, uh, but a team like Pittsburgh might value that at 24. And so, you know, I would not be surprised if, if Pete Fryermuth, Pat Fryermuth from Penn State, you know, baby <laughs> Gronk, you know, teams are looking for these mismatch weapons inside the red zone. So, you know, if I was a betting man, do I do I think two tight ends are going to go? Uh, I think Vegas had it at one and a half. Probably not, but I wouldn't be surprised either. Hey, Rick. Um you, you mentioned some surprises and, and some NFL personnel people are going to have uh, people on their first round board, so to speak, that you might not expect. And I, I want to pick your brain on potential players like that. You mentioned some of the tight ends. I keep hearing the Georgia corners, uh, Eric Stokes and Tyson Campbell as potential uh, first round picks late uh, in, in the process. Maybe Joe Tryon as an edge rusher. Any names you're hearing that, you know, you see all these mock drafts that would surprise the average fan that might be going in the back end of the first round? Well, I think you might have six quarterbacks. Uh, Kyle Trask out of Florida is a guy that's been linked to the New Orleans Saints, and he could be, uh, you know, now with, 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 
with the back end of the first round of veteran team looking for a quarterback and not wanting to miss out. So Trask would be a guy. Travis Etienne, there's a couple teams. You know, everybody thinks Najee Harris is going to be the first running back off the board. There's actually a couple teams looking to trade up and, and take Travis Etienne much, much earlier than people are talking about or discussing. Terrence Marshall from LSU, I think, is a guy that really doesn't get talked about enough in terms of being a first-round pick. Spencer Brown out of Northern Iowa, to me, uh, the FCS prospect is a guy that should not be ruled out when it comes to first-round uh, consideration. I also believe that you know Nick Bolton out of a, uh, Missouri is a guy uh, undersized, but, man, what a tough, hard-nosed player. You might remember Sean Bradley out of Temple uh, a couple years ago. Nick yeah. Bolton from Missouri, very similar uh, type of player. You know, Jody Mack had a good one uh, last night when we were chatting. Asante Samuel Jr. I mean, if there's a team, if these cornerbacks at 10, uh, you know, Horn or Sertain, they start coming off at 10 and, and 12 or, you know, Greg Newsom suddenly comes off the board. Hey, does, does a team value a slot nickel back in the back end of the first round, such as an Asante Samuel? And one of my favorites, Richie Grant out of UCF. This guy is, to me, the best safety. He went down to Mobile uh, at the Senior Bowl and proved it. And one other guy, you know, Divine Diablo, it, from my understanding, out of uh, uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech. Tech yeah. yeah, he's a dark horse candidate to be a first-round pick. Uh, Vegas doesn't even have him on the board. So there, there's, yeah. there's the v variety of different of opinions right there. Yeah, he's Speaking a hybrid player. Jody and I were talking about the kid from Notre Dame, who I love. Mm. I, the Diablos like that positionless, you know, I think the NFL is evolving in that way, but Jody brought yeah, up yeah, a good the point. Panthers written all over him. Yeah. Right? Jody brought up a good point. People talk about it, but it necessarily hasn't translated, but I think we are headed in that direction. Diablo was a guy who I said, wow, he's, he, he might go a lot higher than people expect. And he's well put together. He's uh, battle tested tested very well from a measurable standpoint and yeah i mean it's just again it's the information gathering process the media didn't have the access like they did in years past not at the combine not at the pro days so all of their information gathering process has been a lot through you know text messages and you know relying on third party sources and 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 so hey it, i think it'll be fun Again, like leading right up into the start of the draft, I think you're going to start hearing all these leaks and who's being, you know, we're starting to get to it now. Jimmy Garoppolo can be had. Julio Jones is available. And I think you're going to see a lot more of it. Let me ask you about information, Ricky, because uh, as you say, tougher to come by this year without the combine than previous seasons. Caleb Farley was thought to be an unquestioned first round draft pick <sighs> right there with Sertain and Horn as a potential top cornerback taken. Uh, did not have much of a season because of opting out and injury. He has had a procedure on his back, and backs are such tricky things. Um, how much is his physical status going to affect his draft status? It's big. To me, I, I get nervous about a back because x-rays can't tell you much. You're, you're relying on the, on the player's word. And anytime you have a back issue, again, that's always in the back of your head. He just had disc surgery. He hasn't played a game now, and who's keeping track? 510 days. Yeah. So by the time he takes the field, it's almost two years have gone by coming off a disc. I don't know. To me, I have a hard time taking a player like that in the first round. If I feel that way, I'd imagine there's at least one team that feels that way. So I don't even have Caleb Farley in my personal top five rankings. I just can't do it. I want somebody who's, who's healthy and, and ready to go. In that same vein, Rick, um, Jalen Phillips is an interesting player for me because I think he's a top 10 talent. If you didn't have the issues, uh, the concussion issues, sort of the, the semi-retirement. Uh, he also loves music. People hold that against him because they think that might be his real passion. How, how do teams weigh that versus the, the ceiling? Because, I mean, in a typical year, if you had none of these so-called red flags, and by the way, Chip Kelly, I think, was a big part of it. I think Chip Kelly destroyed his love of football, similar to the city of Philadelphia for a while. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, he'd be he'd be in the conversation to be a top 10 pick for me. You think somebody dives into that 
pull a little bit earlier than expected? I agree with you, John. I, I believe he's a top 10 player for me. But, yeah, you have a hard time, again, justifying the risk-reward. Okay, well, this guy can probably come in and, and be an immediate situational pass rusher, maybe contribute five to ten sacks as a rookie right out of the gates. He's that talented. But you say, hey, what happened at UCLA? Was it a Chip Kelly thing? Was it a medical thing? Was it the three concussion thing? Did you lose the love for football? Quitting the team or taking a hi hiatus is, is very, very uh, taboo in the NFL front offices. You know, Kylan Hill, uh, the Mississippi State running back, is about to find that out the hard way because he quit on Mississippi <clears throat> State. He also quit on his high school team as a senior. And so anytime a player quits, f red flags go up. Uh, yeah. Jalen Phillips, to me, though, is too talented, right? And he had the wrist. I think there was a knee. But now suddenly the Ravens, two picks at the back end of the first round after the Orlando Brown trade, they're sitting there at 27 and 31. They lost Yannick Ngakwe. They lost Matt Judon in free agency. To me, I, I can't envision a scenario where Jalen <laughs> Phillips slides beyond the Ravens. I mean, this is a team, again, a contender looking to compete and kind of plug and play a guy. It makes a lot of sense. All right, Ricky, last one for me. And, yeah, just mark me down as a bad guy to ask this question, but somebody's got to ask it. Um, NFL Network, ESPN. I think ABC is going to stay away from something like this, but either the two other broadcasting networks are probably going to have a guy sitting in the green room. Uh, they're only going to be 13, 14 guys actually in attendance at the draft, but they're supposed to have upwards of 45 or 50 with cameras at their homes to be broadcast whenever. Um, easier to do with a green room guy, but I guess they could do it with, with a virtual guy as well. Who is going to be the one that isn't drafted in the first round that they're targeting or following all night long? That's got that long look on his face. That's on his phone, checking to make sure he hasn't gotten a text. I uh, can't believe he dropped this far. Who's going to feel the pain of night one of the NFL draft? Well, you know, Kadarius Tony out of Florida, I think it's lost a little bit of luster. He was really down in Mobile. Everybody was talking about a first round lock. There's some off the field character concerns there. So maybe he's a guy on a more uh, uh, notable. You know, it's hard to envision out of the first round, but somebody I could see waiting much longer than what they were thinking is Trey Lance. If the 49ers do indeed pull that trigger on Mac Jones, I've, I've spoken to teams. They say, hey, this guy's a day two prospect. Hey, he's a day three guy <laughs> for me. So I understand it only takes one team to fall in love. But are there, there are definitely teams that don't even view Trey Lance as a, a as a day one or day two prospect. Man, Rick, last one from me. Uh, when we talk about this process and, and we talk about the lack of information you guys have had this year versus other years and the medical stuff, you know, this week was an interesting week because you go back to the famous Bill Tobin, Mel Kuyper thing. And I think the context of that that's lost is, you know, Trent Dilfer's agent at the time said that he's not going to play for Indianapolis. So uh, th that's the kind of information team executives have that we can never have. And how much does that skew sort of the board, the fact that uh, any personnel person, not just you, but anyone uh, doing this outside the league circles, Daniel Jeremiah described it as, I'm sort of like a 33rd team. Is that how you entered this process, knowing you don't have that that real detail that, that NFL teams can have? Yeah, and, you know, there's two scouting services that a lot of teams subscribe to, which are called the Blesto yeah. and the National, right? The, the, the average NFL fan might not be aware of the scouting service that collects all these information. And this year had more holes, you know, than a slice yeah. of Swiss cheese, right? And so, yeah, I mean, I've spoken to teams. They got a hold of our database. We share information. They're saying, hey, heck, how, how are you getting all this information? This is more elaborate than what we have. Well, I mean, we've got a network of 50 guys scattered around. We're, we're global now. We got guys overseas in Germany collecting information on international prospects. So uh, it's pretty elaborate. And the fact that, you know, I have relationships with schools that go back decades now, I can get a call back. Some schools, hey, Ohio State, I'm still waiting on hold. So, <laughs> yeah, hey, yeah. And, and I think you'll see that, too, with the NFL teams, right? Because the veteran scouts that had those relationships this past year 
are getting those callbacks where the beginner scouts, maybe they don't have that relationship. I can tell you what, the pro liaisons, they don't have time to call back 32 different scouts with 32 yeah. different teams and coordinate 32 different interviews with their star players. Like, it's just not on the top of their priorities. So, you know, I think the teams that do have those veteran scouts are going to benefit uh, greatly come draft day. We are glad that we always get a call back when we reach out to Rick Saratella. <laughs> I ask, he comes. Rick, a pleasure. Know that if the fans still want the PDF, you sold out of the hard copies of the NFL Draft Bible. Tell them how they can still get to get you to send them a quick, a, extensive PDA on the upcoming NFL Draft. Yeah, allaccessfootball.com for the PDF and then nfldraftbible.com. Uh, which will redirect you to the Sports Illustrated website. We'll have live coverage 40-plus hours throughout the three days of the NFL draft. Rick Saratella, thank you much for joining us here on Birds 365. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Rick. All right, Jody, i got to go fix my lighting issues. Uh, get to those lighting issues, uh, Johnny <laughs> Mac. We'll come back. Uh, we'll wrap up hour number one. Get ready for Trey Wingo. Join us hour number two here on Birds 365. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify.